All right, my name is Peter Olkers. I'm the vice chair of the Needham Conservation Commission, sitting in for Janet Bernardo, um, who is the chair. I'd like to open this meeting Thursday, March the 10th, 2022. Um, and so going down the agenda, Clay, minutes? Uh, no minutes. There's a batch gonna, that's going to be circulated at the next meeting. OK, and no enforcement violation. OK, so let's go on to the hearings. So uh, let me read my script, and then we can be off. As a preliminary matter, this is Peter Olkers, Conservation Commission Vice Chair. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Artie? Here. Bill? Here. Stephen? Here. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Clay? Here. And then Debbie will be later. And then I do have a list of people, some of whom are here. Just want to make sure our connections are working. It looks like the Ridge Hill conversation folks may not have arrived yet. So um, let me call off the people for the hearings. Uh, Brian Nelson? Here. Phil Paradis? Correct, here. <laughs> Tom Ryder? Yes. And uh, Melissa? Is she planning to come? Melissa Rico? Yes. No, no I think okay. I'll, I'll be handling the meeting, thanks. Okay, so just you. And then um, the team from the town to talk Ridge Hill will, be, will come later. All right, good evening. This open meeting of the Town of Needham Conservation Commission is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we've been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of, the pub of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. For this meeting, the Needham Conservation Commission is convening by Zoom app as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. The general public is allowed and encouraged to ask questions during the meeting when directed by the commission chair and through the use of the raise hand feature associated with the Zoom meeting app. Those that have questions or comments regarding a particular hearing will be called upon in the order they raise their hand. So please be patient. All supporting materials have been provided to members of this body and are available on the Conservation Commission website. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless the chair notes otherwise. We're now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. The chair will introduce each hearing on the agenda. I will introduce the applicant and or their consultant to begin the project presentation. After they conclude their presentation, the chair will go down the line of members inviting each by name to provide any comment or questions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and please state your name before speaking. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. Uh, that's it for the opening remarks. Um, so we can go straight to hearings, one of which I understand um, we've got a request for a continuance. Was that actually even on the agenda originally? The, so uh, do we not need to do anything? The boat launch? Oh, it's the boat access. Okay, so we do need to open and continue it. Okay. So I want to open the hearing for South Street and Dedham Avenue boat access, DEP file number 234878. This is a continued notice of intent. They've asked for a um, continuance. So um, I assume this would be March 24th. Correct. Um, can I have a motion? I move that we continue the South Street Dedham Ave boat access um, 
hearing until March 24th. Second. All in favor? Hardy? Aye. Bill? Aye. Stephen? Aye. Peter? Aye. So that will be continued until March 24th. All right. Um, Clay, what do you think we should go first? The South Street or, or the Walker Pond? Um, I think that we should probably go with South Street first, um, and then we can have both the the town projects kind of back to back. Okay, very good. So Brian Nelson is here from Metro West Engineering, uh, and Brian, what do you have to show us? We we got a revised planting plan. Can you take us through it? Sure. And and I will say that the clay um, submitted earlier this evening via email a list of each of the trees that's coming down to just make it easier to sort of track what we're talking about. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thank you. This is Brian from Metro West Engineering. I um, apologize, my camera's not working tonight. I can see you all fine. I just uh, don't have any video coming back through this side. And if I can share my screen, I'll, I'll put up the um, plan that we had submitted. And um, it's been a while since we've, uh, we've been before you guys. So I just wanted to, um, basically, you know, kind of give you a little familiarity with the project. We had um, basically the two sites, uh, 631 South Street is on the, the top of the page or north side of the, and 649 is located at the bottom or the south side of the property, both front on uh, South Street, which is running from basically south to north uh, along the right side of the page. And both properties are owned by the same owner of the Mitchells. Um, they live at 649 South Street, which is a house down at the bottom. And um, Mrs. Mitchell's mother-in-law lives at 631, which is shown right here. And we had been before you guys um, a few times to talk about the removal of, of seven uh, dying or dead trees. Um, and basically we had a, a removal schedule shown at the top of the plan, I think, as you said, Clay had listed them. Um, there were two white ash trees, um, two red maples in American elm, uh, one snag, which was, I think, a pine and a, a large red oak as well, which were kind of scattered in this area here. Um, Mrs. Mitchell was looking to remove those as their hazards, basically, to, you know, the yard and basically the, the traveling back and forth from, from house to house is, um, as the kids travel to you know, their mother-in-law's house. We had proposed the planting of, you know, basically the removal of those trees, um, leaving snags to the, basically the highest height practical, practicable, um, leaving fallen logs on the ground uh, adjacent to where they're cut for habitat value. Um, planting of six new trees, uh, three black gum and three swamp white oaks, and then planting of 45 shrubs, which would be a mixture of winterberry, spice bush, viburnum, and uh, red osier dogwood. Um, pursuant to our last meeting, which I realize has been a while, um, we did circle back with the owner and, and basically got her blessing on the planting plan. We did um, look at kind of at the bottom of the screen Closer to South Street, uh, one of the comments I believe we had had from the last meeting was to, to try and kind of fill in this area with some plantings, which we've done as well. And I think that was really the, um, the extent of, of the outstanding comments from last time. I think we were pretty close um, to hopefully a final plan. Yes, that was my understanding too, that... that um we had talked through uh, what the commission wanted and it was just a matter of getting the actual plan done um, and, and put before us. Um, I will send this out to the commission for, for comments though. Um, Artie, any comments? Um, no, nothing right now. Steven? No comments. Bill? I think we've vetted this one enough. I think I'm all set. <laughs> Allison? No comment. All right. I have no comment either. I, I guess this this is something we will have some 
further discussion maybe in the order of conditions when we when we discuss it uh, as well um i am um yes there's no reason to <laughs> for, for any more discussion about this necessarily i all i the only thing i'd i'd like to and and the the owner's not here so i mean if it's possible to convey that that this is supposed to remain a natural space so that once these things are planted in it should not be treated like lands like traditional landscaping where you have mm -hmm. people in and they neaten it up and and all that stuff this is this is intended to go as wild as possible i know that you are removing invasives so that some uh you know level of management that that ideally is is maintained but but overall it should be remain as as natural so no leaf removal and and no neatening up or pruning of of the shrubs and and that sort of thing okay um so that i mean that's my only comment um well folks are we ready are we actually ready to close this after long last no nah, no no <laughs> i just want to keep talking about it's gonna be something else <laughs> sorry brian we're, we're, we're holding it, we're keeping you in suspense. <laughs> um, I will end, I will take a motion to close this hearing. I move that we close the hearing for 631 and 649 South Street. Yeah, sorry. Did I actually open them? I don't think I opened them. So so let, let me formally open it so that we can close it. Um, so first one, 631 South Street, DB file number 234872, continue notice of intent. And actually, before we actually, we, close this i don't think clay is there anyone in the audience uh we do have people in the audience so i do want to give if anyone has a comment on this who came for this particular uh hearing sort of a last minute question or, or thought um this is your opportunity any raised hands No raised hands. Okay, so we can move on. So I'm sorry. Um, now we can close 631. Steve, you, you made the motion? Yeah, I move that we close 631 South Street. Second? Second. All in favor, Artie? Aye. Stephen? Aye. Bill? Aye. Allison? Aye. Peter? Aye. So that hearing is closed, and we'll talk about the order of conditions later um similarly 649 south street db file number 234874 i'd like to open that that's a continued notice of intent and now a motion to close it i move that we close 649 south street second all in favor Artie. aye stephen aye bill aye allison aye peter aye so that is closed as well um all right thank you very much brian thank you all I, I appreciate um all your time and your patience with this one so um thank you so much and i uh, hope you all have a great night thanks thank, thank you, you take, care. take care and i think in that one there's there was some order about that that we can talk about um potential special conditions but um all right so let's open the next hearing this is Zero Walker Lane and Zero Charles River Street, Walker Pond Stormwater Improvement, DP file number 234884. This is official notice of intent. Last time they were before us to get some ideas, but because this is an official hearing, uh, we should probably hear the entire plan, um, particularly for people who, who might be in the audience hearing it for the first time. Um, and so, Tom and Phil, you're here to present. Um, so talk us through this plan. Yes, hi, I'm Tom Ryder uh, with the Town of Needham Engineering Division. So uh, Phil Paradis, uh, he's worked on the plans and uh, specifications. Um, this is a, uh, a project that we're trying to make some improvements to the stormwater. Um, and it's, it's gonna be, more, um, it's a project that uh, we've been uh, hopefully working with the uh, association for Walker Lane. Um, anyway, so Phil, uh, will you be able to start with the notice intent? 
Sure, sure. Thank um, thanks, Tom, and thank you, commissioners. Uh, so, as as Tom mentioned, we are uh, providing uh, a small portion of the uh, phosphorus control plan that uh, is has been developed um, for for some time now. So, if I can share my screen, I'll just take you a brief introduction of the purpose and the plan for the town. <clears throat> All right, can you see my screen? Yes. So this is a, a plan of the um, town of Needham. And uh, we did uh, in 1918, uh, uh, 2018, we did, Beta did a, a stormwater management, a water, watershed management plan in anticipation of uh, providing uh, improvements to the various watersheds in the in the town. Um, so you, you can see this this is actually 16 watersheds. The, the one we are focusing on, the one uh, the town chose to do first is uh, watershed two. And that watershed is here. Uh, it also it contains a, a, a major portion of it is uh, tributary to the Walker Pond. Um, um, each one of these little watersheds is an, an is, is an outfall to uh, the water system here. Um, <clears throat> so we did a pretty in depth uh, study of this watershed, and uh, in particular, we were in uh, consultation with uh, the town relative to what's been going on at the Walker Pond. Um, from what the uh, reports indicate is that it's substantially uh, degraded because of the phosphorus load. Uh, there's a significant amount of uh, algae and, and, and growth uh, in the pond. And uh, so these, these improvements are meant to be the start of the, uh, <clears throat> of the uh, improvements. So the, they will focus on a few watersheds that directly uh, directly discharge to the pond. Um, WL14 and WL13 are, are, are uh, watersheds that uh, are on Walker Lane that will directly uh, discharge into the pond. So, uh, so our first project is really to improve this watershed. Uh, and in parallel, we will we are proposing to to provide some because in our discussions with the uh, butters, the the neighbors here, they indicated that there's a significant flow coming down Charles River Street uh, to a sluice that exists right here and goes into a a, 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 a man-made channel that receives both the uh, streams up upstream here and and discharges it directly into the pond. So, so these three areas don't, don't currently have any uh, phosphorus load reduction capabilities. Uh, so this, this project is, is meant to rectify that. And between the, 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 the three watersheds here, <clears throat> we propose to reduce uh, the load approximately two and a half pounds per year of phosphorus. Now, when we did um, when we did the analysis for the uh, can, um, we did all the watersheds, and uh, according to our calculations, we need to reduce the load uh, to walk upon by thirty three point seven four. So this is just a small part of that product, uh, opportunity. So, um, but it's a start. And I think it's a pretty good one. We are testing out um, some of our uh, tools that we will be using uh, in the process. Um, so let me just get to the uh, to the project itself. Um, the project involves uh, work on a, on a section of Walker Lane that uh, currently goes from Charles River Street to a dead end uh, situation here before it goes to the private section of, of Walker Lane. And Russell Road uh, comes in at this at, in this leg. So right now there is a 24-foot uh, wide roadway 
that uh, comes <clears throat> through and well, with a pretty expansive intersection, a paved intersection. And uh, so these both, both, both sides are curved and um, currently the drainage system is a, a pair of catch basins here and a pair of catch basins here at, at, at these two locations with a direct uh, outlet to the pond. Um, so the, the plan is really to, to do a number of different uh, techniques, low impact development techniques and um, uh, best management practices really. Uh, I, I know they came up with a new name for them, but right now we'll refer to that as, as the techniques we'll be using. So the, the plan really is to uh, reduce the pavement width. Uh, so we will saw cut the pavement and remove the pavement and the curb on this on this uh, on the north side of, of Walker Lane. Uh, we'll also cut the pavement and relocate the curb uh, at this uh, at, at this location to reduce the, the the overall pavement width. So pavement. Um, so we will reduce the, probably about five thousand square foot of pavement um, in the process. We will then install a, a, a 12 by 12 stone diaphragm. Uh, stone diaphragm and then grade uh, a, a, an eight foot section, primarily an eight foot minimum section of uh, vegetated uh, filter strip uh, at, a, at a, a relatively level. Uh, slope to, to provide as much uptake as you can through the vegetation. And then um, ultimately, because this is kind of the minimum length for a fil filter strip, uh, we will provide a, a, an infiltration system that will, um, infiltration trench that will also you know, pick up the drainage on the other side. So the other, <clears throat> the, the pipe on the other side will be re retrofitted with a uh, leaching manhole with a sump. The idea there is uh, to provide some pretreatment before we get an infiltration. Also, we, we think the, the water table is, is too high to have a full infiltration system. <clears throat> so the goal is to maintain a, a separation of two feet between the infiltration portion and the, and the uh, solid portion of the of the basin. Um, so and then it will overflow uh, once once this fills up and the info, the pipe system fills up, there is a T. I don't know if you can see that. Let me just expand that. There is a uh, outlet T that will be retrofitted and direct the water back into the existing 12 inch RCP pipe. So the idea is to maximize the infiltration uh, and then provide an overflow so we don't get ponding, et cetera, in the street and, uh, and situation. So there'll be th this location and also at this location. We also are gonna tie together those two by, by providing a, an eight inch um, perforated pipe set in stone again, to maximize the, the infiltration uh, and, and treatment of, of phosphorus. Basically, the easiest way and the most economical way to treat phosphorus is by infiltration. Uh, so we will, we will provide as many practices as we can uh, in, in the particular situation. Uh, and luckily, the, the, the soils in, uh, in this area, both areas are rated as uh, A soils. Um, so uh, that it makes it really uh, ec economical to provide the infiltration. The second project includes um, clearing a portion of the conservation land that is uh, adjacent to uh, Charles River Street, and then providing a, an infiltration basin. Oops. <coughs> um, We'll provide new catch basins. Right now, there's no, there's no formal drainage system uh, on Charles River Street except for that sluice that I mentioned previously. 
Uh, so we will install two uh, catch basins uh, just opposite the the area to uh, to provide an infiltration basin. Um, one of them will have to be special because we believe that there's a, a water line that's right under the curb or or, or the gutter line of the of the of the project uh, of the roadway. So and then we will again in, institute this uh, uh, sump manhole. Uh, similar to the others, um, in 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 such to provide some pretreatment again, uh, as well as infiltration properties. Uh, th this time we will provide a low flow outlet, an eight inch pipe to a infiltration basin uh, with an overflow directed toward the 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 kind of valley that goes to the wetland over here. We will provide a, a um, overflow pipe <clears throat> directed to a uh, sediment for, for, uh, outlet sediment trap, provide a little more treatment prior to uh, discharge again to, the, to this area. So this area wraps around, if you go back to, uh, so this is the conservation land. This, the, the wetland actually wraps around and goes through, a, like you can see the, the, the main, channel here but but this would allow a lot a lot more uptake of the drainage even even after um, what it, what doesn't get in the infiltration basin so so this is a significantly uh, improved um, uh, way of treating this uh, again it all ultimately all gets in back in this channel and, and back into the pond so you, you're not losing any water but you're going to have a much uh, cleaner opportunity, uh, much reduced phosphorus load. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, um, so those are the two projects. Um, I know the last time we talked, uh, the major consideration was the amount of trees we were uh, removing. Uh, let's see if I can. So we did, uh, since, since uh, our informal discussion with you, we went out there and surveyed all the trees uh, adjacent to and within the, the area that we would be cleaning, clearing. Um, so as you can see that the, the, the trees are fairly dense in here. Um, you know, and there's, this is not a very big area. This is probably the, 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 the width of the, of the access is, is 50 feet. So this is maybe 75 by 30-ish, you know, so it's not a very big area, but you got all these trees um, that are in this uh, area. And we proposed to remove, um, I think initially we were proposing to move 10, nine or 10. Uh, subsequent to that, um, we uh, went to the parks. We asked for guidance from the parks department and they indicated that uh, two of these trees are, are, are dead or dying. So this particular, this is a large, uh, I don't know, 30 inch. And this is a, I, I forget how the size. We have, a, we have an updated plan that I can show you in a minute. But, <clears throat> and we have a dead tree here. We have uh, sugar maples. We have, I think, four Norway maples uh, within this one, this area, and we also have uh, one uh, <clears throat> red maple. We per we purposely reduced the width of this section of the swale because this is the wooded section. So we purposely reduced it to avoid uh, impacts to uh, the, the the trees that almost come up to the road. Uh, whereas we widen this out for the, the field area. Um, so subsequent to this, so those are the trees we are proposing to remove. The plan is to replace, let's go to the basin first, replace trees uh, with um, <clears throat> uh, some sugar maples and some uh, red maples. Uh, there's also, yeah, so the original plan was to provide 
uh, three and three, so six trees in this area to compensate for the for the uh, amount of trees that were done. But we also added trees in the bump out area, uh, this side and this side. These are smaller trees. Um, they are what are they called? Um, I thought there was a was there a service berry? I think or yeah, yeah, yeah. Service berry, yes, correct. I'm not a tree guy, so I don't know much about them. But um, <clears throat> so, but I think uh, during your site walk, you can fill me in, Tom. Uh, you met one of the abutters, and they were concerned. And as were we when we initially looked at where to put trees, we really didn't want to put them in this field, open field. Uh, for fear that we would be uh, hiding the, the the viewpoint of the pond itself. Hopefully the pond clears up and it'll be much more attractive. But uh, but we were, um, so we're, we're asking the, the commission maybe to consider not, the, not including these trees, um, but plant these trees. So we would, uh, so according to this, this design, if we eliminate these three trees, there would be six at the pond and three here. Um, but also, <clears throat> if we're going to remove those two trees, uh, we came up with an alternative design um, for the basin, adding uh, a couple more trees. Um, so some, some uh, river birch and what was this one? Uh, a tupelo. I'm not familiar with that one. Uh, but the, to remove the dead tree that's over here, and there was, a, there was a dead tree or dying tree here. So we replaced those with the river birch and the tupelo tree. So, in, so now in this basin area, which is a very small area, we're proposing it to install nine trees. Um, and then if we maintain the three on this side, we would have a, a approximately 12 trees. Yeah, you know, we not approximately 12 trees planted. Um, and uh, so I also wanted to kind of review the the uh, the trees themselves. So um, this ultimate the ultimate plan would be to we're going to remove uh, a red ape, a red maple, 12 inch caliper. Uh, Sugar maples, there's three of them. We'll, we'll remove the four Norway maples. Um, there's another red maple. No, this is a duplicate. Because there's no red maple. So this is a duplicate, sorry. <clears throat> and then there's three uh, dead maples or dying maples uh, in that area as well. So so really there's, there's uh, one, uh, four, maybe five viable trees uh, that we would be cutting down. And according to this plan, as it's shown, we would be 15, but we want to make this 12, um, 12 uh, new plant, new trees. So, so that's the plan. Um, well, I'm open to questions and discussion. Peter, you muted. I'll run this by the commissioners, but one of the um, uh, suggestions might be to think about the species of trees that are being cut down and take into account the fact that five of them that are proposed to be taken down in that in that sort of dense area are in fact Norway maples, which are really an invasive species. And so they are trees and they have some habitat value, but they are also not the kind of trees that we typically want in these areas. So, so that might affect the replacement count uh, going forward, the, the dead trees too. Um, so, so I think there's a little bit of room to negotiate sort of the, the number of trees that are gonna be replaced. All right, but I will ask the commissioners now to see if they have any comments about this. Um, Artie?
Uh, no, I, I've seen I've seen this before, going through different uh, some other scenarios, other meetings, and so I'm I'm good. Okay, uh, Bill. <clears throat> Just uh, two two issues. Um, I'm not familiar with the conservation land that's out there. Um, is it the only access into that conservation land? So I, I believe it's the only access. So we left uh, a 10 foot swath on this side. Uh, obviously you have to nego negotiate the trees, but uh, to make sure, we, we made sure that the pond did not extend all the way to the edge. Okay. Uh, so that was the intention of kind of squishing it, make it longer. What what is a what is a conservation land? Is it, is it mostly wet? It's uh, yeah. So uh, I don't know if we can see it from the other plan. So the conservation land is is primarily wet, except for this little stub. It's all this the land behind here. It's a Okay. Um, my only other question is I know Walker Pond, Walker Road um, has always, has talked about sewer, uh, future sewer lines and things like that. Was any thought given to um, where that line might go? And is any of the work going to affect a future sewer line? So the sewer is installed uh, through, through this section. Uh, yep. So I don't think it will impact. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. I'm sorry. Did you say Walker Lane? Yeah, Walker. I thought Walker was looking. They were all. They were all looking for sewer. Although. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think that's the private area that they wanted the sewer line in. Yes, I, I'm sorry. So, um, yeah, part of this uh, improvement project really started with like a an, an initial phase, which was to uh, construct the sewer. Uh, it's not on this plan, uh, but we did connect. Um, there's an endpoint over uh, at the dead end where yeah where the point is right there. Yeah. Um, we connected to that and uh, we're able to connect uh, four residents. Uh, I think two of them have already uh, connected, okay. and that's on the private road side. <clears throat> Great. Thank you. Very good, uh, Stephen. Uh, no comments. Allison. I have a couple of questions. Um, I'm unhampered by knowledge. My lack of knowledge, I don't have any knowledge about um, phosphorus control. I understand the concept of what you're trying to do, but I was wondering, um, when I looked at the infiltration, infiltration basins, the structures themselves, they have you know holes on the side so that they can infiltrate into the, into the, into the soil, um, which will reduce the, the sulfur. But what I'm wondering is, is the sulfur load, you know, highest in the summer? Because in the winter, where those holes are will be frozen. So I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm wondering, is that, is, is the phosphorus load the highest in the sort of when, it, when the ground isn't frozen, like fall, late spring, summer? I, I presume it is, but I don't know. So, okay. So, so uh, the uh, phosphorus load, the, pho the uh, ground has a, you know, a, a frost depth of anywhere from three or four inches to a couple feet, mostly. In severe weather, you know, it, it yeah, know. Doesn't, doesn't exceed four feet. But these, yeah. will be, these will be uh, underground. Oh, and I know, but I'm, the holes are close to the surface. They're not four feet down. I mean, in the winter, I mean, I don't know. See, maybe it doesn't matter because if the, because it, so, you know, if it, if, it, if it lifts up and it, you have an emergency overflow in the winter time, let's say if it doesn't infiltrate and there's huge storms, like we're having these weird storms in the winter time where the ground is still frozen. So it doesn't really matter because the phosphorus load, I mean, phosphorus happens because of biological activity and fertilizer load and things like that, right? I mean, I'm just thinking that it would be, I mean, I don't know. I'm just asking you as the expert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so I'm explaining. There, there is obviously you're going to have a pressure with this cold air above it for the ground to freeze. But, but also there is a, uh, uh, an ambient temperature of the earth. I know, it's like 50. Yeah, I know. 
Right. So that so that the majority of the basin won't be frozen. And but the even, holes are where it will be frozen. I'm looking at holes, right? Those little circles right. where it's supposed to go into the soil, right? So, so water only freezes if it's stationary. If it's moving, you know. But the soil, but the ground be... is frozen. Not it's crushed stone. It's crushed stone. There's crushed stone around it with oh, voids. Crushed stone around it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So. So again, it's only getting at the point where that you think that these that these that these basins are big enough. When I think of a 24 inch diameter basin, it's not that big, and it's quite a large area that you're draining. And it just it just occurred to me, they look kind of small. Like I'm not a civil engineer. I don't know. Right. I mean, you, you know, I don't know. So these these are all sized to provide a minimum of 0.7 inches of infiltration. Which is which will give you ninety percent phosphorus removal. So again, we have to do multiple projects like this throughout the watershed. So we're trying to be as economical as we can, and also be as frugal as we can with with the. Uh, so this is not meant to infiltrate everything. It currently doesn't infiltrate, but it's it's meant to infiltrate the first 0. 0.7 inches of runoff from a storm event. So okay. that's the goal. All that, right. The, uh, all right. So all right. So you're you're you know it's it it doesn't really matter if it's winter or summer. You don't you know load maybe more in the summer or fall, but it doesn't really matter. It it'll it'll work. And so and so then my second question is: Is the town prepared to do the maintenance required to clean these sumps and to clean where the where you know where you have the four bays to clean, to do that cleaning because when they fill up with silt, they don't work anymore. So are right. they are they on board to do all that clean? So so we that's that's primarily the reason why we're using these sump situations. The town is familiar with uh, cleaning out catch basins which have sumps, and 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 we'll likely add this just to the list of of maintenance mm -hmm. requirements in the yearly basis, um, as opposed to an open sediment four bay. You have a four bay in the other on the other on the other project. There's a four bay. No, we don't have a four bay there. Oh, I saw I saw I let a, a word that said four bay on on the, the little the little you know the open you know retention basin. I saw I, I saw it on the plan. Am I crazy? I don't know. Sediment. I saw it. Sediment. There's a trap. Uh, they have to don't they have to clean that out? I thought I saw a four bay over here. Well, last the last plan we did, but we decided to to change that again for the maintenance issue. Oh, to those okay, okay. To to uh, provide a, uh, a, a um, kind of the same practice. So okay, again, we okay. we will probably use the the these uh, uh, these practices the the dry well with a sump practice throughout the watershed. So. We just we did as we're thinking through the, the whole process. We wanted to make sure that, uh, as as you mentioned, the the idea of, of maintenance would be fairly straightforward for the town, and uh, they could in, incorporate it if they don't do it themselves. They can incorporate it at a in a relatively uh, seamless uh, practice. Uh, so, so I just have one one last comment, and I'll be quiet. And that is the, the, the sugar maples, even though you're cutting down a lot of big sugar maples and they're lovely, lovely trees, I adore them. They're not doing well. Um, global warming is, is, they've been dying for like the last 20 years, really, everywhere south of Vermont, even in Vermont. So I would suggest that you don't, this is just my suggestion, I'm a landscape architect, that you don't plant sugars, even though they're beautiful and native, but you, you plant maybe more tupelos, maybe some some um, swamp white oaks. The red maples aren't quite as affected. It's just it's just a, a suggestion. Tupelos are more of a southern tree, but you know everything in Massachusetts has become almost like what a southern climate was when I first started landscape architecture 40 years ago. It's really amazing um, what you can what you can grow here now and what's moving in. So tupelo is a, is more adapted to um, rain, large rain events and warmer climate, um, as is swamp white oak. So 
I suggest that. You have to do it. You can ask your own landscape architects, but that's my suggestion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a good. Well, I, I don't, again, I don't know trees, so that's okay. not my, my area. <laughs> I can check with uh, Ed. Um, Ed likes the river birch too. Um, the river birch are great, but they do get that, you know, Asian longhorn beetle if it comes around here. They're, they're, they like maples first, birch second. <laughs> Just, just so you know, I mean, that's why, I mean, I've been planting a lot more oaks than I ever planted before, even though they do get anthracnose. But anthracnose doesn't tend to kill them. Um, so I hope the Asian longhorn doesn't, you know, I mean, it seems like it sort of isn't what had happened in Worcester, it was just terrible. Um, it is around, but it, it doesn't seem to be quite as scary as it was 10 years ago or 15 years ago. But they do, they do love maples. And there's, a, you know, there's so many maples in this part of the world. You know, that's what... You know, Needham is maple, oak, and pine. So if you can kind of diversify a little bit. You might, they might live a little bit longer if they do get if the Asian longhorn gets in here. If you, if you use an oak or a tufelo, they don't, they don't usually eat them. And they kill the trees. They will, they, the boars will kill them within two years. And there's nothing you can do about it. So I know it's sad. Okay. Uh, so can I ask you? I can ask you about the um, Norway maples. Mm -hmm. Do you, would you agree that they should shouldn't count as full trees or or? Well, you know, you know, I'm working I'm working on a project in Lexington, and Lexington is a little bit like Cambridge. They have really strict rules, and they count a Norway maple like any other tree. If you cut it down and it's in a protected district, it, there's no difference. The only trees that they don't count are Iolanthus and Buckthorn. I'm just, just, just saying, that's not Needham, but there is a, there is a town that, and, and you know, they don't, they don't distinguish it because there is habitat value. Yes, they are, they are you know, invasive and they take over other, you know, other trees, et cetera. The birds nest in them and, you know, insects eat the sap and, you know, I mean, squirrels make their home in them. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I don't know. I mean, we don't have a stance on them just because a tree is invasive. We don't want to plant them, but I've, I've actually never heard of don't count Norway maple if you're cutting it down as, as don't, you don't have to replace it with anything. I, I haven't, I, has that ever happened in our commission? I don't think so. No, I just, I don't know. Are they aware of the two to one policy? I just mentioned that since they're not making the two to one policy and a lot of the trees are taking down our Norway maples, that maybe those could count as a one to one replacement since they're invasive. I don't know what our what our, our rule. I don't think it's written down anywhere. Right. So that's that's it's kind of at your discretion, I think. Of, of, the, of, the, of conservation commission. Just, um, just a thought. I mean, yeah, so you know, I and more shrubs you don't have to you know you don't have to plant just trees you can plant some you know um there's lots of lovely you know, winterberry and you know um i just don't know if they were going on a one-to-one -one replacement idea with their planting plan or if they were aware of the two to one are you aware of the two to one Tom? so so uh yeah we we understood that from our informal meeting last last time. Um, again, we we did we I, I think we made an effort to maximize the amount of trees we could do within the work area that we were ha we have. Uh, we obviously don't want to put trees directly in the infiltration basin, um, but we kind of maximize the spacing around the basin uh, as well as. Uh, introducing the idea of putting some in the in the new uh, pervious area that we're creating as as we remove move the pavement on Walker Lane. Um, we are, and if you wanted to, you could take those three shad, or I call them shad, but there's amaranth here, and you could move them on the other side because they don't they're not very big they're not very big, and they're multi-stemmed and they grow together. You know, I mean, if you wanted to, because they're they're less expensive than planting you know, uh, red maple, for instance. So I, don't know, so I, didn't, I didn't understand the species you said again? Oh, we, 
the, the six you had, you know, the three and three, and you wanted them, you didn't want to plant the ones on the right and the upper. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, but you could move them on the other side and just have a grouping of six. They're not very big trees. And that could go toward the, the two to one is what I'm saying. Okay. Okay. You could do that. I mean, it's up to you. Yeah, no, 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 no. And then it'll have more of an impact, you know, right away. It'll look more like a bosque or, you know, a group, a natural grouping. Um, okay. Because okay. three, you know, you're going to plant these little teeny weeny trees. So, <laughs> you know, they may not all, all live and you may end up with four, you know, 20 years from now. And that might look okay. Okay. Um, okay. And they're less expensive than planting a swamp way or a, in general, not always, but typically they're less expensive. It's, a, it's, up to you. it's up to your discretion, but they count as a one-to-one. -one. They do count as one tree, you know, even though they're small. Okay, yeah, no, I we'll just move these over here. Yeah, we can fit them there. in. We'll group them, like maybe three and three or two and four, and four, and four whatever, whatever you, whatever you, looks good to you. Right, right. I think the, I think the neighbors really still want a clear view of the pond. So if we can move these over here, you know, um, they'll be beautiful in the springtime. They they bloom white, right? Then they have a nice berry, and they, they, they so okay. So we can do that. They don't like being planted in the fall, so if you can plant them in the spring, it's better. Yeah, yeah well, the the, pro, the plan is to get this out to bid as 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 soon as we can. You know, you're a little late. <laughs> People are busy. Good luck. Yeah. The, the other thought uh, is uh, we could look at the other side of the pond on the uh, on the playground side. Um, Put them over there. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is not shown on the plan. Which we, yeah. you know, if uh, if the I neighbors, know, I, know. We, we, I live in Wilson Lane. I mean, I I know this area. Uh, obviously, we're going to be talking with some of the neighbors uh, to make sure that um, you know they get clear view. Um, so if it looks like it's too congested, we, maybe we can put it on the other side of the pond, some of them. Yeah, yeah. So I would be, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, that's, you're not going to block the view, even with those three little trees, you're not going to block the view. I mean, they, they don't, they don't um, have a canopy until they're about, you know, seven feet up. I mean, when they're grown and they're deciduous. So six months out of the year, they're, there's nothing on them. It's not like you're planting, you know, fat evergreen trees or something, you know, like at the dump. So you're not really blocking the view with these little trees, but never mind. They think you're blocking it. It's okay. You do what, what works for the neighbors. But, te but technically you're not really blocking the view <laughs> with little shad. They're just, they're not gonna do that. I will say if, if we run into, if we do have an accounting problem with the number of trees, um, uh, putting shrubs, low pro profile shrubs, might also be a solution in, in that area. Um, yeah. um, and our typical shrub replacement policy is four to one. So four to, to one replacement tree. Um, all right, so um, just a couple other things before I, I give the um, public a chance. So um, it looks, it's been requested by staff, I think uh, Deborah Clay can speak to this, that uh, because the DEP hasn't reviewed this yet, that we should wait and see if they have any comments before we make our final determination. Is that right? So I, um, they asked if I could reach out to DEP because we didn't have a file number. Um, so I did um, reach out to um, to um, the DEP and heard back today that there is a file number. Um, it was just given a number yesterday, but it just got passed on to the reviewer. Um, so to be safe, we should hold off issuing until they have time to review and, um, and comment. So that's our recommendation. And I also, um, so, it, it also seems and it had some feedback as well. Um, mm -hmm. And that includes specking a 12 inch silt sock for erosion control, labeling it as such on the on the plan. And then yeah. and then a, and a condition in the order of conditions 
for staff to be staff to be on site um, when they work next to the pond. Seems to be her comment. Yeah, correct. All right, um, Deborah Clay. Any other any yeah, other they, comments? So the the silt sock. So we have a. You want to? Yeah, she it? wanted you to change that. Um, she doesn't want you to use the straw waddles and the silt fence. She asked that you change it to 12 inch um, um, filter sock. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. Um, I will take comments now from the public. Is there anyone raise a hand? Uh, we do have at least one raised hand. Um, David Newman, I will go ahead and uh, allow you to unmute. Um, I'll actually prompt you to bring you in. So uh, you should see that prompt um, and then you will be able to unmute yourself after that. I do have a couple other things when he's done. Okay. Hello. Hi, David. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yes, um, my name is David Newman, and I'm the owner at 34 Russell Road. Um, and that is at the corner of Russell and Walker Pond, where you see all that shaded area in front um, that goes out into the street. Now, I'm a relatively new owner of this property and this, this plan is all coming new to me. Um, and I have some questions about what's happening in front of the property where you have the shading there. Um, is it my understanding that you're reforming the road and bringing the curb out into the existing road, removing those um, drains and narrowing that, that road there Walker Walker Lane, um, is that my understanding? What's happening? Correct. Okay, Correct. so it, this is the first time I, I, I've I've seen this, and it's um, you know I, I do have land some landscaping in front. Um, I, I'm looking at several of your um, diagrams here, and, and I'm seeing. Uh, several trees may be added to that part that goes into the existing road. And what cover is that? Is that soil, by the way? So we would remove the pavement and install loam, uh, a loam, um, loam area, and, and and then plant the trees. Okay. It, it also will be graded such that the current stormwater flows off the pavement and continues down to a catch basin right here. So this is the natural low point. So we didn't want to necessarily take that flow, try to direct that flow around to this basin because the, the road goes up and we would create a pond right here at this driveway. So the idea is to, to allow the, 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 the runoff to continue through this planted area it would also be seeded with wild seed mixes as, as um, uh, the wild flower uh, pollinator seed mix, as well as on this side. So they would kind of mimic each other. What What is loam? I'm sorry to be a little ignorant about what that means. Topsoil. Topsoil, OK. Yeah, yeah. Plantable okay. soil. What kind of trees are going to be planted there? So these are called uh, service berry. Okay. Uh, again, I'm not a tree guy, so my, my landscape architect, you know, pick these trees. So I, from, and if from, you want, if you want to know what they what they look like, I can tell you. It's up to you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Appreciate it. You yeah, know. Okay, so so typically a service berry can be either multi stem or single stem. They don't get that big. They're like you know get to be about the size of a, maybe a crab apple. They're a native tree. They have a nice, simple green leaf and kind of a, a light colored bark. Um, and they have um, lovely white flowers before the leaves come out early in the spring. And then they have a little tiny berry that the birds like in the fall. And they're deciduous, so they lose their leaves. They, they turn a nice kind of yellowy 
and it sort of makes it yellow and orange from the color. Um, and they're, you know, they're, they have a lot of habitat value for the, you know, the birds and, um, and animals. And um, they're pretty, I mean, they're, they're not as, you know, they're not ornamental like a crab apple, but they're ornamental in a, in a sort of subtle, pretty way. And, um, and they're, they're, they grow all over, the, they grow all over, like if you ever go down, you know, to Dover on, um, you know, across the bridge there, they're all along the, the, the water there, Charles there. And the little ponds on either side in the springtime. You can see them, what they look like. You'll be able to see them this this spring. Uh, 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 um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a little disappointed in that, you know, I don't know if there was another hearing prior to this, um, you know, about these plans. And uh, I had no, no idea that this would affect the frontage part of this property. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know how that's going to look with the existing you know, landscaping that's there, and maybe I don't have any privilege or rights to say anything about it. But um, it's it. There's several other things too. It significantly affects um, the ingress or the, the um, entrance to the driveway. It looks like it substantially changes the angle of the driveway. Um, am I correct about that as well? So, so the idea was to bring you out perpendicular to the to the line of traffic. Um, yeah. Okay. So that it would be safer for both for visibility from, and also, um, so that uh, that's typically the same. I did the same thing with Walker Lane. I brought it out perpendicular to this this kind of because there's a more travel. There's only one person that has access down here, so. This is yeah. going to be the travel, the most traveled route. So I brought the road out perpendicular to that, as opposed, you know, again, it's a it's a traffic safety issue. So, um, on the other side, on the other side of the driveway, there is um, a mailbox that I have that would be impacted by you bringing the curve out, curb out, uh, more into the road. What does one do about that? So, I mean, we could work with the town and relocate that, you know, as part of the project. It's not. Hi, Dave. Uh, I'm sorry, through the chair. Uh, this is uh, Tom Ryder with the engineering division. Yes. Um, we, we will be um, uh, communicating with you on uh, before we go out to bid on the project, mm -hmm. uh, just to make sure that we can clarify the plans and, um, you know, meet what the expectations are sure. uh, to follow through on. So that, that is the intention. Uh, so we're bringing this to the conservation. Uh, we, we really do need to get this uh, to bed as soon as possible. And there's some, uh, and we're in the jurisdiction. So. Um, well, I understand that this is the first time I've seen this. So I'm a little bit, <laughs> I mean, right. it does it, it impact, you know, the front of the landscaping that I have in the yard. And um, also just the ingress into the, into the property, uh, I mean, it might be attractive, it might not be, but it's kind of like, wow, it's, it's a lot for me to see at once. And I came onto the property uh, October 9th, 2020. So it looks like there were plans prior to that um, to do this work. And I, I realize, you know, you have to move forward quickly with your thing, but it's, it's a lot to digest for me. Um, and I do appreciate, of course, this conversation, um, but it's, um, yeah, I, so at what point do you bring somebody to talk to me and do we have any kind of ability to change uh, what is existent in a type of trees or anything like that? So uh, the intent is to uh, walk through with the Conservation Commission and then uh, uh, get the plans uh, finalized. Uh, uh, through the Conservation Commission's jurisdiction issues and then uh, meet with the residents regarding uh, just clearance on, you know, your uh, visual or uh, where to plant trees, how to, how to set the curbing, uh, correct uh, curbing uh, questions and concerns, um, and, and just go over the overall plan. Okay. And that, that will probably be in the next couple of weeks. Okay. Yeah. And um, no, one more no. Sorry. Can, I, can I just interject real quick? So this is this. So this ideas have been floating around, but this is 
the the plan has really come together in the last month. So it's not it's not something that we're hiding from anybody or whatever. Um, we were asked to consider removing pavement um, in an informal meeting with with uh, town folks uh, maybe a month ago. Uh, so really, the, this this it's come it's come together in the last you know month or two. So it's not. Uh, it's not something we, and these are practices that we would like, you know, to um, to, to, to try here and, and implement elsewhere as well. So the purpose of removing the pavement is again, what is that purpose? So uh, uh, stormwater, stormwater runoff is generated primarily from impervious surfaces. Uh, and all the pollutants. Uh, so when, when stormwater runoff uh, hits an impervious surface, it, it can't infiltrate into the ground. It yeah. takes whatever's on the surface of that uh, and, and carries it away to, uh, and, and in this case, uh, the uh, catch basins and ultimately to the pond. So by providing uh, pervious surfaces, which are planted areas or grass or, or natural woodlands or, or such, by allowing those, there is a, a, a fair amount of infiltration, particularly in the, the rating of soils. This is within an a, a A-rated soil, which is highly permeable soils. Uh, so the idea of there is, there is a significant improvement by just removing excess pavement uh, without doing any other other effort, so uh, so at the at the advice, you know, we're really moving a, two feet of pavement the entire length of the road here, but at, at this intersection, it, it's really an excessive pavement amount. So um, so that's a, a un, it's a, the most economical thing we can do is to just remove impervious surface to provide treatment. And, um, can, can you tell me on in front of my property um, exclusively what will be the widest uh, what would be the um, most amount of land that it goes into the existing pavement area from where it is now say from from the existing curb into the road uh, I uh, so the the curb line is is basically, uh, this right here, right about, I don't know, seven or eight feet off the, this is on the property line, the back of the, the, the work, all this is within the town right away, but the, the so I'm going to say maybe 20 feet, maybe okay. up with the 25 feet at the most. Okay. Um, so it's, you know, again, you're going to, it's just going to be a, a wildflower mix pollinator. Again, it's going to look like the, the opposite side of the road. Uh, these are, uh, are can be tall grasses and uh, small small plants that provide habitat for um, pollinators, bees and stuff like that, along with the small trees. So, okay, all right. Thank you very much. Yep, it should look pretty nice, but you know, yeah, it might look have, pretty nice. Yeah. You have a little lawn area, so but. Yeah. Thank you, David. Yeah, the, um, this is, in fact, the first official hearing on this, and your presence here, I think, is very important in order to give them feedback about about the plan. So I hope that that conversation will continue with them. Um, we're not going to close the hearing tonight. There'll still be at least at least one opportunity um, because we are waiting for comments from the DEP. Um, um, any other comments from the public? Yep, I will go ahead and move David back over to the attendee side. And we have one more raised hand, um, Barbara uh, Hushka. And I apologize if I mispronounced that. Um, just a moment while I prompt you to promote to panelists. Once you accept, you will be moved back into this side, and then you will have the ability to unmute. All right, now you should be able to unmute. Yes. Okay, here's my husband, Peter. Yes, <clears throat> Peter, Peter Hauschka. We live at 105 Walker Lane, which is 
and we've lived here 41 years. Um, we are, um, most of our, well, all of our road frontage on Walker Lane is um, exactly 22 feet from your saw cut uh, along the, pond, the straight part of Walker Lane. Um, so my first question <clears throat> in, is in relation to these saw cuts. Um, along the, the part of the, the cut that's the narrowest uh, right across from our property is also a, a cable, I, I guess a Comcast cable uh, with a, a junction box that's about <clears throat> two or three feet in from the pavement now. So is, um, I presume that all the construction, because there's a, a Comcast uh, fiber optic cable that goes all the way along that side of, of Walker Lane on the pond side. I presume the construction will avoid manipulating this cable in any way or, or uh, damaging it. But I guess the real uh, question I have is um, regarding the mowing as a maintenance, which is mentioned, I think, on um, section, eight. section eight, page 24 of the overall document, it said that the vegetative strips um, that are being planted with the wildflower mix should be mowed to three to six inches on a regular basis, uh, rather than be tall grass or even wildflowers, because I can't see much of a meadow of wildflowers uh, blooming if there's if it's being mowed uh, three to six inches. So, um, what, so one specific question is the mowing um, an essential part of maintaining an infiltration um, trench? So, so uh, we we will change that. That that that's not correct. Um, so unfortunately, that's that's more of a practice for a, a grass infiltration base. <clears throat> okay, so we will um, make correction. Yeah, and, and my real concern was um, the suggestion that maybe the whole meadow uh, all the way to the pond would be mowed. Um, about when we first moved here in 1981 uh, for another 15 years or so, that a whole meadow was mowed about every couple of weeks. And as a result, there were uh, 20 to 40 Canada geese living in that meadow with their uh, flocks of young um, most of the time because it was easy access from the pond and they could scoot right back into the pond if they needed to. Um, and so any mowing of any of the area under consideration in your drawings would uh, bring Canada geese out of the pond where they're not being chased by the, the uh, mute swans that are nesting there now. And um, just for an example, your your phosphorus removal estimates are something of the order of a few pounds a year. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, and so um, a goose in a year, or one and a half geese in a year, make a pound of phosphorus excrement. Um, so twenty geese can produce roughly fifteen pounds of phosphorus a year, um, which is way over the whole removal of your whole project. So I think one of the issues of having any mowing at all is that it attracts geese and then you have created a, a phosphorus problem that you're trying to solve. Right. Um, so that's well, one point. Right. So I think, so I think we're gonna consider reducing it to once or twice a year. Uh, rough, you know, primarily to keep the um, large growth, um, large, you know, larger tree growth from um, at a minimum. So mm -hmm. um, I, I'll discuss it with my landscape architect, but um, that is that is something we yeah. typically do for meadows. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, there. I mean, the other thing in the meadow is that there are wild blackberries, there always have been. And uh, if you mow those, they're gone. Um, and they don't, you know, they don't uh, give any fruit, which is a wildlife uh, boon in the summertime in August. So it's, I would just request that the meadow itself be untouched because that's what makes it look like a nice meadow. The grass there now is roughly 15 to 20 inches high in the summer maximum. 
and you can walk through it easily all the time and people do. Um, now, the other point I would wanna <clears throat> make is that I wonder whether these bump out zones, which uh, basically um, there's one on either side of, of um, the narrowing of Walker Lane uh, to where it goes, goes by the catch basin. Um, is it really necessary to have both bump out zones? I can see the one on the pond side making sense to reduce the, the area of pavement there, but I'm wondering if the one uh, that's a, a, across from that, that was just under discussion with uh, David Newman's property, uh, whether that's really needed. Is it, does that, is that essential for the whole process of water flow? Because in a way, I think it's uh, you know it's creating a lot of expense for the project with um, new granite curb stones and and installation and then maintenance later on. And the one the question is whether it's really essential if you didn't do that side but just did the the pond side of the bump out uh, would that still work? I think we're looking for opportunities to remove pavement. So any opportunity we get is, like I said before, is a an opportunity to reduce stormwater runoff naturally. Um, so I think it may be an expense to move the curb, but in the long term, it'll be a benefit to the town. I mean, I can I can go back and, and talk with the town and see, yeah. you know, how crucial that is. But yeah. but I think every the, the challenge is, you know, we have to reduce uh, the phosphorus load to this the, to this pond and ultimately to the Charles River by 33 pounds. And you know, this is only a, a couple pounds, but it, it, we have to do a, quite a bit of work in order to reach that goal. And every little bit helps. Um, so... Yeah, no, I, I understand. And I think, I think you're, you know, the plan overall uh, makes a lot of sense. And uh, it certainly uh, deals with the, the biggest issues from the street runoff. Um, I'm wondering though, where does most of the phosphorus on the street that's then washed off by a rainstorm, where does it come from? Automobiles? It, it's, it's in the air. Uh, yeah. It's, you know, whether it's from, you know, pollutants or, or other things uh, it's all around and anytime it it gets on a, a, a an impervious surface it, it has nowhere to go other than mm -hmm. to, to be washed off and ultimately right. into whatever water resources yeah. most adjacent I, I was just thinking this is not a high traffic area therefore compared to say Charles River Street um, it is the phosphorus runoff from this um, this part of the pavement so great that, um, you know, ignore, uh, say eliminating the bump out on the, on the other side of the street uh, would really matter that much because it's well, again, probably only a thousand or two thousand square feet of pavement there that you're removing compared to the yeah. 5,000 all along. It's a couple thousand. Yep. Yeah. 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 Well, well I, I mean, I, the sidewalk is not really necessary there either. So. Right. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, it seems though that that you know when when the bump out is actually uh, becomes uh, virtually a part of the um, a butter's property, although it's going to be maintained by the town, that's a sort of a tricky situation. That um, in the way it looks, it's almost going into the and it's, it's taken over the sidewalk there as well, right? So um, it's an area that, um, you know, that needs to be delicately handled in order to not Im impede the, uh, you know, the, the, that property itself, so. At any rate, that's, those are my, my comments and thanks for your attention to them. Thank you very much and um, I, I think we've we've heard your concerns and, and hopefully further discussion can happen before the plans are finalized. Um, 
Uh, let's see. So, Deb, you still had some thoughts? Um, I just wanted, because Janet um, had brought it up, um, I hadn't gotten out there to look at the wetland resource areas um, due to the snow and, and other things. Um, so they did go with their, um, with their existing delineation. So I just wanted to say, I, I mentioned to Janet that since we weren't gonna be able to close tonight that I'd you know try to go out next week just to make sure we weren't missing any um, resource areas that we needed to account for. Okay. All right, so a few more steps before this is all uh, set. Um, all right, so we've been through the commissioner, talked to the public um, and relayed Deb and Janet's comments. Um, and we'll probably end up continuing this. So, or I mean, so, is, a, yeah, so may, maybe just a, more, a little more guidance on the count, how we're counting uh, these. I just want to make sure that you know, ultimately we, we get, we come up with a plan that, that. Is... Right, 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 right. Well, so, so, so usually if it's a dead tree, we don't count it unless it's within a, um, within the wetland. And this is, it's not, it's, it's in a buffer zone, but it's not in a wetland currently, the dead tree. Correct. Correct. Okay. So usually the dead trees don't count. Um, though within the buffer, we, Tip, well, we've just been through this. Even dead trees are ones that we. Um, so we usually try, if it's a dead tree, to have them leave a snag. Um, right. If that's so not in this possible. Case, yeah, in this case, it's not possible, right? Mm -hmm. They're in, they're in the footprint, so we can't. Right. Um. Yeah, so so the official pol the official policy is two to one. Um, I think given Allison's guidance, even though they're Norways, there's they still have value as trees. Um, um, so two to one, and then if they're if you want to do shrubs as, in as part of this, then that's a four to one, and that's the basic accounting. Okay, so so if we have twelve trees, but three are dead, so we need to replicate nine trees. Um, right now, we have fifteen trees shown on the plans. Right. So, so yeah, I mean that would right exactly. So we're missing three, um, and then so there'd have to be some plan to to either convert that into shrubs if you don't have the space for the trees or you're worried about um, sight lines um, is is basically the calculation that we're looking for. Okay, so if we add another 12 shrubs somewhere, mm -hmm. that would, that would uh, make us even? Yeah. All, yep. right. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so hearing all that, um, Anyone want to, actually, we can go back from the screen sharing now, I think. Okay, I'm sorry. Let's see, so um, um, I assume this would be continued to the 24th meeting. Um, so can I have a motion to continue? I move that we continue zero Walker Lane to March 24th. Second. All in favor, Artie? Aye. Bill? Aye. Stephen? Aye. Allison? You made a gesture, I guess. Aye. Okay. Aye. And, no, I'm saying aye. <laughs> and Peter, aye. So this, this will be continued until the next meeting on March 24th. Um, Thank, you very right. for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. Um, so one last a uh, potentially extensive piece of business is discussion of Ridge Hill demolition plan. Uh, Clay um, gave us what they had given us bef 
before, it's sort of a previous thing that there was probably some updates. Um, and there's several people on the list. I just want to make sure that you are able to hear us. Uh, Hank? So, so I didn't have a chance to check your audio before, uh, so I just want to do it now. Uh, Hank, can you say I or here? Uh, yes, here. Okay, perfect. Um, Ken? Right here. Dave? Yep, I'm here. And Chris? I'm here. Okay, so uh, uh, Hank, I understand that you're doing the, the presentation. And well, uh, I will I will introduce uh, our architect. Okay. Um, okay, very good. Yeah, I'm I'm Hank Aft, director of building design and construction. As you may know, um, the town is planning to tear down the house, the mansion, and the garage up at the Ridge Hill property. Um, that will be done uh, this summer. Uh, we intend to go out to bid within the month and. Um, uh, get the contractor on board uh, by May. Uh, the work would be done, uh, as I say, during the summer. And then um, any final planting, which would be a wildflower mix largely, uh, would be done in the early fall once the planting season starts. Um, we have gone through some refinements, as was earlier mentioned. Um, of the plan, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Dave Menser from Doran Whittier to walk us through that plan, if that's acceptable, Mr. Chair. Sounds good. Right. Dave, can um, you share your screen? Yep, I'll, I'll give it a shot here. Let's see. All right, should be able to see this plan now, hopefully. Yep. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm Dave Metzer with Doran Whittier Architects and I uh, also have Chris Garcia um, with GGD on the line, who's the plumbing and uh, civil engineers for the project. Um, so brief overview, I, I understand that you've already seen the sort of first round of plans. So this does include some, as Hank mentioned, some refinements to that scope. Um, the, the general idea is to demolish the existing manor house, the, the garage here, um, take out all of the um, paving that is uh, the asphalt paving from uh, the construction fence here and replacing it with a, a gravel drive um, and then planting grass over the area and you know grading out the areas that have been demolished. Um, so the limit of work for, um, let's see, for the project follows in part the this sort of property line of the selectman or the select board um, jurisdictional area, I guess, or, or lease area as it might be called um, along this edge. Uh, and the only work that's really occurring outside of that is um, the replacement of a water line by the DPW before the general contractor comes on board is gonna come in, go underneath where the drive is and then um, the removal of one abandoned uh, septic structure and then puncture and fill of some other septic structures um, across the drive. Um, and then those areas where the work's occurring outside of the property will all be also seeded, you know, filled, seeded, um, and covered with uh, a meadow mix uh, afterwards. Um, and then within the property, uh, boundary. There's the, the the new gravel drive that's going in, and then everything else is just going to be um, planted over. Uh, there are, I think, two oak trees that are being taken out because they're really close to this structure, and any demolition is probably going to damage the root structure. And then a few, um, well, somewhere between a half dozen and a dozen yews, I believe, um, around the manor house that are also going to be um, taken out as part of the, the demolition part, but that's the that's the the main the big picture. Um, I think since our last discussion, um, the the limit of work has been uh, radically reduced, trying yeah. to lessen the impact um, 
of the project um, on the site. And um, uh, also, uh, Dave, there's a line that follows on the downhill slopes uh, you'll be putting in, the contractor will be putting in uh, in various areas, um, the uh, um, erosion control system. Yeah, that's uh, yep. that's the, the gray dashed line. There we right. go. These heavy dashed lines are the erosion control on the downslope sides of, of all the work areas. Uh, and then a little bit around where they're taking out this uh, septic structure, there's a little bit of erosion control there as well. And, and those large trees that are, are within that area um, that want to be protected have the dashed lines around them. Right. So there's and that'll large be part tree. of the scope for the contractor. Right. These large trees are all going to be have protection on them. Um, if, if they're within the the right the, the fenced area. Yep. Hank, was there also were you going to be um, putting a line up to the to the barn? you had mentioned um well what we have subsequently found um is well the the water the water line that feeds the barn currently the water comes into the house and then goes up to the barn dave maybe you can show where right, that you goes. can barely see this light gray line here is the water line that comes out of the house and goes up and feeds the barn and then also feeds the garage so that's DPW is going to do the work ahead of the general contractor to to cut that and then um, install a, a new water service through the roadway and then connect it up and into the barn. So it's going to stay in the roadway. It's not going to go um, to the right side of that tree. That, right. The idea was just to avoid going through the trees. Okay. Right? So, yep. so that's changed. Okay. Yes. Correct. Yep. Yeah. And and when they're doing that excavation, if the water line that exists between the, um, the house and the, uh, and the barn is in good shape and is of adequate size, they may be able to tap in and just use that line. But at this time, they're assuming they will have to bring it around uh, underneath the roadway. Right, so this calls for the potential location of the new water service, um, which is gonna be DPW work. Uh, is right here. But if that's no good, then they'll continue and connect back in this way. Yeah, I just, I know when we were there with Eddie Olson, he was just concerned about, um, you know, digging a trench that close to the tree roots. Um, yes, and we're, they're, they're going to try to stay as far away from those tree roots as possible. Because mm -hmm. um, that's a really large tree. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, any any other questions? All right. So so thank you. Yeah. So let me um, go make the rounds of the commissioners to see if they have any comments. Artie. Uh, no. Uh, Stephen. No comments. Bill. Uh, just curious to know if any like soils have a sample for lead. Or anything like that, you know, lead paint and all that stuff. Um, we did before. do a, um, a EPA phase one site assessment as part of the initial feasibility study. Um, mm -hmm. They did they didn't find any evidence of contaminated soil, but there is a buried fuel tank next to this garage, which is going to be taken out as part of the project. Uh, and we do have an allowance in the project budget to to remediate soils in that area. Thank you. Um, Allison? No comments. Yeah, and so um, I know there's some question about work in within the meadow. So most of this is within the um, uh, select board's um, jurisdiction. And I assume none of this is in any sort of buffer area. So it would formally Correct. be under our jurisdiction, except for the work that's being done in the meadow with the water service and and that area where you're um, in the in the couple areas where you're filling things, um, and I there's some question about um, when that disturbance is going to happen and 
and how long it's going to take to be sort of filled back in again. Our, our expectation is that work will start in May or June and take no more than a couple of months. Um, so. so really that would be a just, so, but that's for the whole project. That's for I mean, the whole I mean, project, right? Yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking about, I mean, and, and I guess it depends on the contractor and whatnot when that, when that particular part is part of it. But obviously we would, we would like that disturbance to be as minimal and as uh, short as possible, particularly if it's during the summer because of the potential for disturbing the sort of wildlife, the meadow as a, as a vital wildlife habitat. I also know that there's been a lot of work over the years that's been done in that little area. And so there's a lot of disturbance that's sort of pre-existing um, what you're doing now. Okay. Um, but I mean, that's, I think that's our wish. Um, okay. Deb, did you have any other thoughts about that? Um, no, that's, I mean, you know, there, there isn't really much I think that we can do about that as far as the timing goes. Um, but we did um, take this opportunity to um, to introduce the um, pollinator seed mix in the areas where they were moving the buildings, um, which was great. Um, you know, they were looking um, to us to suggest a seed mix, and um, and Hank, I believe, spoke to um, the town manager that deferred to the commission. So we're able to actually make some larger areas of pollinator um, friendly habitat. And um, so we are, we're pretty excited about that. So at least temporarily while the town is figuring out what they mm -hmm. ultimately want to do this area, it'll, it'll actually extend the meadow uh, significantly. Um, yeah, well, it'll, it'll add the actual pollinator um, seed mix. Oh, the specific pollinator seed mix. Exactly. So more wildflower-ish. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. The same mix that they're going to be using um, in the Walker Pond um, filter areas. So it's a, a good opportunity. Nice. All right. Mm -hmm. um, all right. And, and so this is just a discussion at this point. Um, this is not a voting matter. This is uh, simply to give us give them an opportunity to have feedback um right but it looks great i mean I, I um it'll be nice to have this done finally uh, good yeah I, I i should mention that um we have no clue what the um bid climate will be <laughs> these days and uh if and we do have a deduct alternate for the garage so if we are, if the bids come in crazy high, we would proceed with um, the demolition of the house and probably leave the garage and the ap associated apron, but we would try, we would take out the uh, oil tank <clears throat> that's adjacent to that. Um, and, uh, but hopefully, uh, hopefully we've cut sufficient uh, money out of this. And by the town taking over the two inch water service, we're hopeful that uh, the bids will come in uh, within our budget. Perfect. All right. Um, I have nothing more to add. I think we've gone through the commissioners and, and staff. So thank you very much for the presentation. Right. I, I wish you all the best for getting the bids that, you, yeah, that, will, that are actually workable within the, the budget. So um, looking forward to hearing more. Thank all you, right. Peter. And I, I see, it looks like you have the meadow in your, back, in your background. There. It is, it, <laughs> yes, this is the, this is in fact the meadow that we are, or the other side of the meadow that we're preserving. Yeah. Thank you. All, all right, right. thank you all. Bye. Have a good night. Bye. All right, so that's all. Uh, is there any other, other pieces of business? Uh, we have the order of conditions. Thank you. Uh, and and these have I, these were typed up. Thank you. 
Um, and there are some special conditions as well that are highlighted, but it's identical for both of the properties. Yeah, if you'd like, I can um, just review some of the uh, unique conditions to this project outside of our stock conditions. Um, I did incorporate into the uh, Exhibit A the requirements for each tree, as discussed back in December, um, which ones were meant to be left as snags, fully dropped, etc. cetera. Um, I also added in wording uh, as to not lock in those exact requirements since at that December meeting, um, there was a sentiment that some of these options may not end up being feasible once we're on site. So staff plan to be on site with the arborist uh, just prior to and at the time of cutting to determine how much dead wood can stay without suffocating the other trees and to ensure that we're not creating any safety hazards um, due to this work so that we can be a little bit more comprehensive without locking them into something that, that could create a hazardous condition, um, but using kind of extreme uh, discretion as to, to how much we modify that based on existing site conditions. Um, this project will require a uh, waiver of the 25 foot uh, buffer zone because there are some trees and plantings going in inside the, both the 25 foot and the wetland itself. Um, we did include a two year monitoring period for all of the restoration plantings, um, placement of the plantings and, and the um, removal of the invasive species are meant to not impede the easement that exists on the property, but otherwise it's meant to um, prevent further uh, mowing of that easement area so that it's not treated as lawn moving forward. Um, and one of the, I guess the last kind of highlighted piece to this was whether uh, it was your will to one, include markers, um, some kind of 25 foot bounds uh, that have not been incorporated onto the plan, but they could, you know, space them or include some number of them wherever the 25 foot abuts um, the lawn area. Um, and the other piece was whether you wanted an as built plan or if just having those monitoring reports um, and kind of a final report was enough to be submitted for that certificate of compliance after the two year monitoring. Got it. So the, the as built would, would indicate the location of each of the new plantings. Is that yeah, what, what we would probably include in that as built is the location of the plantings and probably the location of any um, habitat log piles that were created. Um, uh, if that's something that you'd want to see, or I mean, it, if it's done well and if things are spread out enough, it, it may just kind of encompass the whole area wherever Deadwood can lay and it may not be feasible to, to place all of that on an as built without really going kind of through that extra step. Right. Or, or are we satisfied with, yes, just getting it done and then and then getting reports? Um, yeah, so I'll throw it to the commission. So, there, so the, there are a number of things here, but the, the two ones that are jumping out are the uh, need for, for mark, boundary markers and then the question of whether we need an as-built or not. Um, and so, Artie, any thoughts? Bill? No. Steven? Uh, I like the idea of having some sort of um, markers. Um, and I don't think we need to have an as built. I think the reports and or more importantly, Deb and Clay's um, approval carries a lot of weight. Allison? Allison? Oh, I think you're on mute still, sorry. Still mute, can you hear me? Yes. And now we can hear you. I agree with Steven. <laughs> I was yes. telling you, you were, you were muted, Allison, and realized I was muted, I was telling you, exactly. you were mute. <laughs> Everyone's mouth is moving. Um, yes, so so I would, I would actually concur that, that 
keeping this in here, I think makes a lot of sense because we're not interested in them sort of increasing their yard. We really want to make sure that that's, that's, uh, that the line is maintained. Um, particularly if, if there's some concern about landscapers going in that they should know that they're passing into a particular a protected area. Um, uh, and then, yeah, it sounds like from what I hear that uh, at least Stephen sort of agrees that uh, as built, not necessary. I think I would concur as well. Um, all right, um, so first piece of business and, and we'll have to do this just um, because that's the procedure uh, to talk about the waiver and, and get the waiver and then the waiver fee. Claire, Deb, do you have any guidance on whether we should waive the fee? Um, in my opinion, the work being done in the 25 foot buffer zone is not substantial. Um, I think the majority of these trees are actually within the BVW and they are doing the, the mitigation planting. So as far as permanent alterations, we're not, uh, th there are no additional structures or anything like that. Right, and so it's a lot of mitigation work actually within the, the zone rather than, and certainly not any building. All right, so it sounds like uh, the sentiment was would be to to waive the fee. Okay, but first first order, do I have a movement, uh, a move to, um, to a motion to to waive waive the work within the twenty five foot within, buffer zone? Yes, thank you. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Sorry, <laughs> Stephen. Aye. Bill. Aye. Allison. Aye. Peter. Aye. Aye. All right. Uh, now a motion to waive the the fee. I move that we waive. The can, we, can, we have a com can we have a conversation about this first? Oh, Do sure. Okay. okay. Yeah. No, I mean, I know Steve. You're about to make it. The only the, the only comment I have. So my apologies, Steve. Is that that um, it? Same sounds like. I mean, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll put it towards what degree of work do we have to do our, do we have to do or do play and Deb have to do related to this project, which is, which does have a connection to the fee. That's, that's my only comment as far as whether we decide to waive it or not, the amount of work they're doing related to, the, to this project, going out there and dealing with it. That's my, that's my comment and whether we waive it or not. Which is true. I mean, it, the fee is supposed to be for extra oversight close to the resource area by staff. So that's a reasonable thought. Uh, yes. I would, I would say in, in a case like this, like you mentioned earlier, Peter, when the work involves mitigation and removal of invasive species and, you know, things that are going to benefit the environment. I, I think in that kind of case, we, we should be willing to waive the waiver fee, but that's the way I look at it. So. Any other thoughts? Bill, Allison, Artie? Um, just that, you know, I mean, I, I guess going out there, I mean, I don't know the timing you're going to be spent out there. I know going out there when the tree work is being done, the timing of this, going out there waiting and that, that's 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 really my only concern is valuing valuing the time of what's going to be have, what's needed to be spent doing this that's that's my only concern Value, valuing the time going out there and with, the, with all the true work going on these, these were these now we're supposed to be out there looking at what's going on and determining what's going on at the time that's why that's why I bring it up so Clay, I'm assuming you'll probably be the one following up on this since this was kind of your project. So that seems likely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So do you take back the your your comments about waiving the fee, or 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 modifying or mod modifying? Yeah, I mean, I, I anticipate this to be a one, maybe two site visit endeavor. Um, I don't know that I will feel the, the need to necessarily be out there for several hours overseeing every cut. 
but rather doing a, a very thorough pre-construction, um, tagging the trees with the arborists and having those discussions, and then either staying out there or following up as they are dealing with the dead wood. Um, I do appreciate that, <laughs> that the staff time is, is being valued, um, but I also do feel like we do a number of site visits for either potential projects or for people that just have wetland concerns that, that a certain level of this falls into some of those day-to-day -day operations as is. Flight, flight, was there a requirement to be there as the tree is actually being cut? So then to determine if it's going to be able to stay that way, or that all of a sudden they're going to say, cut it as a snag, then all of a sudden they're going to say, you know what, it's not healthy, we're going to cut the whole thing down versus you are going to be required to stay there to determine that. I suppose to them determine that because I pretty much know what they're going to determine. Yeah, I think it's going to heavily uh, come down to how that interaction goes with the certified arborist. I am, I am not a you know a trained arborist myself. I do have some background in forestry, um, but uh, to some extent, I mean, I, I think that that an arborist will have an idea even before starting those cuts to to kind of know. Uh, at least have a, an educated guess as to whether there will be an issue or not in keeping keeping a snag. And I think that the commission review of all these trees was very thorough. The, the trees that you know leaned at a specific angle weren't even really considered for snagging versus just dropping outright. So I think that a lot of that legwork has kind of already been done. But of course, I would stay on call if, if in the event that I don't stay out there through all the cutting. I think that there would be a certain um, block of time where I would plan a lot of other site visits just to, to be on call as needed as well. Does that help, Artie? Uh, yeah, that helps. So I think okay. um, I think I'd put this back on you, Steve, as far as how you what, what you think how what category you think it falls in. I'm happy whatever category you think it falls into. Yes, yeah, so right. I I would I would move to we we waive the waiver fee. Can I have a second? I'll second it. All in favor? Uh, Artie? Aye. Stephen? Aye. Bill? Aye. Allison? Aye. Peter? Aye. All right. So we've waived it. Now for the order itself. Um, and I think we've um accepted the uh, unique condition for the markers and then also the um the not needing an as built um all right can i have a motion i move that we accept the order of conditions for um I forget the addresses. 649 South Street. 649 South Street and 631 South Street. Actually, we have to do them separately. Separately? Sure, 649 South Street, sorry. Second. Second. All in favor, Aye. Artie? Aye. Steve? Aye. Bill? Aye. Allison? Aye. Peter? Aye. So that one's done. And now it's 631, same thing. So we'll just, I. I assume everything will be identical, but let's just to go through the, the motions. I move that we waive the work within the 25 foot buffer zone, 631 South Street. Second. All in favor? Artie. Aye. Stephen? Aye. Bill? Aye. Allison? Aye. Peter? Aye. I move that we waive the waiver fee for 631 South Street. Aye. Any second? Uh, second. <laughs> All in favor, Artie. <laughs> Stephen? Aye. Bill? Aye. Allison? Aye. Peter? Aye. <laughs> and finally? I move that we uh, issue the order of conditions for 631 South Street. Second. All in favor, Artie? Aye. Stephen? Aye. Bill? Aye. Allison? Aye. Peter, aye. So uh, 
those have been approved and issued. All right. Um, is that it? That's it. Steve, it's up to you. Are you ready? <laughs> when did we close the hearing or meeting? Adjourn. Adjourn. <laughs> Here you go. Aye. All in favor. Aye. 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 Thank Aye. you very much, everybody. Aye. Good night. Thanks, guys. Aye. Thanks.